your virtual tour of the early years section of the National Museum of the United States Air Force contains multiple images, video clips, and information about the aircraft displayed in this impressive collection. The first military heavier-than-air flying machine was the Wright 1909 military flyer. It was designated airplane number one, used to train pilots and it was the only Army airplane for nearly two years. The original aircraft was donated to the Smithsonian in 1911 where it is currently displayed. This is an exacting recreation that was constructed by museum personnel. Curtis's 1911 Model D was the second plane purchased by the Army Signal Corps. The control system differed from the Wright military flyer. The ailerons were controlled by the pilot's shoulders while the front elevator and rear rudder were controlled with the column-mounted wheel. Note that it was a pusher aircraft, with the propeller mounted in the rear, pushing the aircraft. Wright's Model B differed from the Model A in that it had a tail elevator and was a pusher aircraft. This is a modified version of the Wright B flyer and was used for pilot training and aerial experiments. As with the Model A, Roll Control used the Wright's patented wing warping system. During the early days of World War I, both the French and British used two-seat Blériot for reconnaissance behind German lines. By 1915 more advanced aircraft relegated them to a training role. Members of the U.S. Air Service received their first instruction in the Blériot with clipped wings that prevented them from taking off. At full throttle, the fledgling pilots bounced across the airfield, learning to control the rudder with their feet. Curtis's JN-4 Jenny was the most famous American World War I training airplane. An estimated 95% of our pilots trained in them. They were used for primary flight training and Jennies equipped with machine guns and bomb racks were used for advanced training. Standard Aircraft Company's J-1 was a primary trainer used by the U.S. Army Air Service to supplement the JN-4 Jenny. The J-1 was more difficult to fly and never gained the popularity of the Jenny. Many surplus J-1s were operated in flying schools and in barnstorming air shows. The SPAD-7 was a sturdy and rugged aircraft with good climbing and diving characteristics and was also a stable gun platform. The American volunteers of the French Lafayette Escadrille were flying the SPAD-7 in February 1918 at the time they transferred to the U.S. Army Air Service. It used a heavier, more powerful inline engine resulting in a faster but less maneuverable plane. New tactics based on speed were developed to take advantage of the SPAD's power. The Avro 504K briefly saw combat in 1914-1915 but was quickly identified as obsolete and relegated to training duty. Its simple sturdy construction and superior handling characteristics made it one of the most impressive and widely produced training aircraft of World War I. U.S. trainees sent to Great Britain learned on it before advancing to combat aircraft. Thomas Morse's S-4 Scout was a biplane advanced trainer operated by the Army and Navy and was the Army's favorite single-seat advanced trainer during World War I. Nicknamed Tommy, they flew at practically every pursuit flying school in the United States during 1918. After the war ended, the Air Service sold them as surplus to civilian flying school sportsman pilots and ex-army flyers. Some found their way into World War I aviation movies. Fokker's nimble DR-1 earned a reputation as one of the best dogfighters of the war. Manfred von Richtholfen, the Red Baron, scored 19 of his last 21 victories flying the DR-1. This is a reproduction because... While Fokker built 320 of them, none survived. French built Newport 28s were the first fighter airplane flown in combat by pilots of the World War I American Expeditionary Force. It had a tendency to shed its upper wing fabric in a dive, so the French operated only a limited number, making them available to Allies. American pilots maintained a favorable victory to loss ratio with it. 
Halberstadt CL4 supported German ground troops by attacking Allied positions. They had both fixed and flexible machine guns and would hand drop grenades and small bombs, making them effective in the ground attack role. Their drawback was that they lacked armor, making them susceptible to ground fire. CL 4s also served as interceptors against night bombing raids. A superlative fighter, the Sopwith Camel was credited with shooting down 1,094 enemy aircraft, more than any other Allied World War I fighter. Its nickname is derived from the distinctive hump forward of the cockpit that encased part of its Vickers machine guns. Tricky handling characteristics, as it was susceptible to spins, made the Camel a dangerous aircraft to fly. More pilots lost their lives learning to fly the Camel than did in combat. The unmanned Kettering aerial torpedo, nicknamed the Bug, was launched from a four-wheeled dolly that ran down a portable track. Control stabilized its flight and guided it toward a target. After a predetermined time control shut off the engine while the wings were released resulting in 180 pounds of explosives detonating on impact. This is a reproduction built by museum personnel. The SPAD-13 was essentially a larger version of the SPAD-7 with a more powerful engine. The U.S. Air Services adopted it as its primary fighter, equipping 15 of its 16 squadrons. It was one of the most capable fighters of the war and one of the most produced. The de Havilland DH-4 was an ever-present element of the U.S. Army Air Service during and after World War I. It was the only U.S.-built aircraft to see combat during the war. Its primary uses were for daytime bombing, observation, and artillery spotting. With inadequate funding to buy new aircraft, the Army Air Service continued using them in several roles during the lean years following the war. A fierce German fighter, the Fokker D-7 made its mark quickly after entering service in 1918. With its high rate of climb, higher ceiling and excellent handling characteristics, German pilots scored a remarkable 565 victories over Allied aircraft during the month of August alone. It was so feared that the Versailles Treaty mandated the surrender of all D-7s to the Allies. This is a reproduction. The Caproni CA-36 was a late version of the Caproni line of bombers. They were used primarily to bomb Austrian airbases. They were the first truly strategic bomber flown by American pilots. The Lusatch 11 was designed by a French aeronautical engineer working for the U.S. government. This was an effort to get an American fighter into the conflict. It was a well-designed fighter but did not get into Europe until after the armistice. Eberhardt's SE-5E was an American-built version of the SE-5A designed by Britain's Royal Aircraft Factory. In 1922 the Army Air Service had 50 built for use as advanced trainers. The Consolidated Aircraft PT-1 Trusty was the first training airplane purchased in substantial quantity following World War I. It acquired the trusty nickname for their excellent ability to make a quick and effective recovery from a spin. It made some students overconfident, who received a shock when they trained in airplanes that had more difficult handling characteristics. The Martin MB-2 was the first U.S.-designed bomber produced in large numbers and became the Air Service's primary multi-engine bomber. Designed as a night bomber, The MB-2 sacrificed speed and maneuverability so it could carry a heavy bomb load. They were the air service's primary multi-engine bomber until replaced by the Keystone bombers of the late 1920s. This reproduction was built using original Martin drawings and completed in 2002. Curtis delivered 46 P-6E Hawks, the last biplane fighter built in quantity for the Air Corps. Never used in combat, the P-6E is recognized as one of the most beautiful aircraft of the 1930s. This is the only P-6E still in existence. 
The Kellett K2 K3 was a two seat autogyro evaluated as a slow flying reconnaissance aircraft, but low performance disqualified it for military use. Autogyros used a rotary wing to produce lift. However, the engine did not power the autogyro's rotor. Instead, aerodynamic forces made the autogyro rotor spin, while the engine propelled the aircraft. Boeing's Model 89 was designated the Army P-12 and was one of the most successful American fighters between the World Wars. The last of the biplane fighters flown by the Army, some P-12s remained in service with first-line pursuit groups until replaced by Boeing P-26s in 1934-1935. Survivors were relegated to training duties until 1941. Boeing's P-26A was the Army Air Corps' first all-metal monoplane fighter in regular service. Affectionately nicknamed the P-Shooter by its pilots, it could fly much faster in level flight than the older wood and fabric biplane fighters. Even with its monoplane design and all-metal construction, the P-Shooter retained some traditional features, such as an open cockpit, fixed landing gear, and external wing bracing. They remained the Air Corps frontline fighter until 1938. In 1940 the U.S. Army Air Corps ordered 203 Curtis O-52s for observation duties. However, OWLs lacked the performance necessary for combat operations overseas. The Army relegated them to stateside courier duties and short-range submarine patrols off the U.S. coast. Douglas's O-38F concluded a series of biplane observation aircraft begun in the early 1920s. With a cruising speed of only 128 miles per hour, it was obsolete by the end of the 1930s. Some O-38s remained in service at the time of Pearl Harbor in 1941. Martin's B-10 was the first modern all-metal monoplane bomber produced in quantity. It featured such innovations as retractable landing gear, a rotating gun turret, and enclosed cockpits. The B-10's advanced design made them 50% faster than contemporary biplane bombers and as fast as most of the fighters. This capability convinced many planners that bombers could successfully attack strategic targets without long-range fighter escort. The Northrop A-17 was the last single-engine attack aircraft ordered by the Army Air Corps. In 1938, the Army Air Force determined that all future attack aircraft would be multi-engine models. The A-17 split perforated flaps proved to be a successful addition to the Douglas Dauntless dive bomber and the post-World War II Skyraider. 129 were built with 93 eventually sold to Britain and France. Ryan's YPT-16 became the first monoplane primary trainer acquired by the U.S. Army Air Corps. It is the military version of the civilian Ryan STA. The Air Corps bought nearly 1,200 more similar Ryan trainers as PT-20s, PT-21s, and PT-22s. North American's BT-14 was a basic trainer with fixed landing gear and all-metal skin. Several foreign nations ordered this trainer. Modifications that included retractable landing gear led to the more famous AT-6 Texan. This exhibit demonstrates what happens when taxiing with the wind and the pilot applies the brakes too hard. Germany faced strict post-World War I limits on developing or using powered aircraft while the Luftwaffe's rapid expansion created a need for a simple but safe glider for primary training. One solution was using the SG-38 as a basic flight instruction standard glider during the late 1930s and early 40s. The Havilland's DH-82A Tiger Moth trainer made its first flight in 1931. It was popular with air forces throughout the United Kingdom as well as the civilian aviation market. During World War II, most Royal Air Force pilots trained in Tiger Moths, including Americans who flew with the Eagle Squadrons before the United States entered the war. Tiger Moths performed a variety of roles, including submarine patrol, air ambulance, 
and even prisoner evacuation. The PT-19 Cornell began as Fairchild's Model M26. It satisfied a military requirement for a rugged monoplane primary trainer as it was more like the fighters they would eventually fly. The Cornell was also used for teaching blind flying to trainees. North American's O-47B was an observation aircraft that had the crew of three sitting in tandem under the long canopy. Since the wings restricted downward observation and photography, North American put windows in the aircraft's deep belly. Training maneuvers in 1941 demonstrated the O-47's shortcomings, so the Army relegated it to towing targets or to flying coastal and anti-submarine patrols. I hope you enjoyed this tour of the Air Force Museum's pre-World War II aircraft. If you would like to tour other galleries in this series, convenient links are listed in the description section below this video.